I think I said this already once, uh, that it is beautiful to, uh, to be together in the church, uh, physically present. And, um, but I cannot escape from a need to do, to do that again. Uh, and especially this morning, the varieties, as I was uh, waiting for, uh, for, my, uh, for my part uh, in the worship, I was looking across the, the audience and it's so amazing that such a variety today. We have uh, uh, all sorts of people, uh, young and old and all, all, all those in between and, 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 and guests and, um, and those that are, that are, that are uh, uh, here. Uh, and uh, it's, um, it's amazing. It is really uh, something that is uh, so, so, much, so much needed after two years of, of not being able to do this. So, um, uh, I'd, li I'd just uh, like uh, to say one more time that uh, we are all, you are all welcomed, and uh, it, is, uh, it is really amazing and, and great to serve God together. So, we are talking about the sacrifice today, right? And um, as we have learned in the, in the story, in the children's story, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, meanings that, that we usually ascribe to that word. And, um, but however, th this word is, is actually not so much frequent in our everyday vocabulary as uh, it used to be in the, in the ancient times. Uh, this authentic uh, phenomenon uh, of sacrifice is even less present, that, that, is, that is kind of portrayed here, is even less present in the, in the mind of the, of the nowadays people. Uh, when we use this word, the, the, that authentic meaning is rarely actually used. It usually refers to something else, but, and, and rightfully so, rightfully so, because when, this is just a little representation here, but imagine a innocent lamb here on the altar, here on the altar and, um, and uh, being slaughtered, right? Um, imagine, blood being spilled, real blood being spilled. Uh, imagine the mess that, that follows and, 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 and the need to clean that. And, and it's just a not, uh, it's, it's, it's an uncomfortable event to be part of, right? Um, the parts of the, of, the, of the Bible that actually speak about sacrifices are the least read parts of the Bible. Christians, they usually like to read about Jesus, right, in the Gospels. He heals people in the Gospels. He, he even raises the dead in the Gospel. He, 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 he uh, 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 feeds people. He creates, uh, uh, miraculously uh, bring, uh, brings uh, bread for them and creates bread for them. So we, Christians, they like this. This is something that is appealing. But when they come to the sacrifices and the details about the sacrifices, these detailed descriptions, they usually what they do is they, they, they describe, they, uh, they skip those, those, those passages. What I would like to, uh, to propose today, uh, let me just see if I am on the same page here with, okay. What I would like to uh, emphasize today is that God, the God of love, mercy and grace who revealed himself in the person of uh, a long-awaited Messiah, Jesus Christ, and his acts of, of healing and care, caring for humanity, was the same God who, was, who had been revealing himself in the complex sacrificial system of the Old Testament, centuries before Jesus' Jesus's coming. The same, the same God. If we carefully look um, into the facts embedded in the history of the Old Test of the of the um, God's Old Testament people, ancient Israel, we may find strong reasons to believe that even though the forms of communication were so different, but the message is the same, the intent is the same, and it is the f and it is the following: God loves human beings, and God saves sinful human beings. The message is the same. If our reference point today is, um, 
God's people at the, at the foot of the Mount of Sinai, then um, we need to, uh, because it is at that point where the sacrifices are stipulated to such great detail. So if that is our reference point, then uh, we need to remember that God gave his people first set of law, of laws, right there, and it, com it consisted of Decalogue, okay, right? And then it also consisted of a certain laws, first corpus of laws, that, are, that were related to all sorts of things, all aspects of, human, of, of their life, including uh, sacrifices and some civil uh, regulations, various laws. However, before giving them this first set of laws, God delivered them from Egypt. So deliverance, the act of delivering them from Egypt, preceded the giving of the law. And um, I'm sure that you might already, in your mind, uh, process how important this is. We usually uh, suffer from something that's called legalism, which states that we can acquire certain status, certain merits, before God by following the law. It seems that based on the Old Testament, that, that is not true. That, cannot, that, my, that theory cannot be constructed. And uh, what a de deliverance that was from Egypt. Um, they imagine that you are forced to work heavy jobs to exhaustion every single day. Imagine that. Imagine taskmasters whip on your back if they're not happy with, with your work. Imagine having no freedom. Imagine your male children being systematically sought to be killed. Imagine these particulars of their life. God delivered them from such a miserable life. Such a miserable life. And can we just for a moment think what joy have they experienced after being delivered from such a life? Can you imagine that part work is still part of your life, but you're not forced to work? There is no more taskmaster's whip there. You have, you're free. You have, just, you have just been delivered, saved. You are free. No male children being sought to be killed. Moms, can you imagine? This is a very, very difficult life. But God revealed himself as a deliverer, as a savior. He saves them from such a miserable life, miserable life. a mighty deliverer. Sacrifices were stipulated in the first seven chapters of the book of Leviticus. And this is actually the second set, chronologically, the second set of laws uh, that, that God have, uh, has revealed to, to Moses. Uh, and we know that Decalogue will, is fine in Exodus 20, and then Exodus 20 through 23, these different laws that I already mentioned. And then Exodus 24, God reaffirms his covenant with them, and in and then we have these sacrifices. Something is either okay. All right. Okay. Either this is something. Something is slow in the process. So these sacrifices. So and then uh, God in Exodus twenty-five, He utters this statement this huge statement profound statement he says let them con he talks to moses he says let them construct a sanctuary for me so that i may dwell among them and immediately after this statement um, we have this second set of laws and they run from exodus 25 through the entire book, and most of the laws in the book of Leviticus are actually these kind of laws. 
And they, all of them, we call them ceremonial laws or we call them sanctuary related laws. Maybe that's more for us Adventists that, 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 that makes more sense. Sanctuary, sanctuary related laws. Uh, and this sacrifice was the backbone of this entire sanctuary system, sacrificial system. It was sacrifice. Um, sacrifice was portrayed to be a prerequisite for their relationship with God. It's a prerequisite. In other words, we do that so that we can. We offer sacrifice, uh, sacrifice so that something will follow, in other words. The, the book of Leviticus lists five major types of sacrifices, okay? Uh, the first one is burnt offering. And worshipers, worshipers would usually uh, offer these sacrifices when they wanted, that they feel that they want to rededicate themselves to God. They want to surrender themselves to God. Grain offering, usually offered for a general gratitude, thanksgiving, thankfulness, thankfulness. Leviticus 3, well-being offering. It was uh, offered uh, as a token or as a gratitude for certain joyful occasions, such as festivals, joyful, fa joyful, uh, joyful festivals, birth of a child, or as a termination or the fulfillment of a vow. Sin offering. Wow, this is a big one, right? Most of the, most of the Jesus' sacrifice actually overlaps with most of the elements of the Jesus' sacrifice, they overlap with the burnt offering and then sin offering. It was there, it was offered to acquire, to seek forgiveness and, uh, and for private sins. And I will talk about, that, about this a little bit later. And then finally, guilt or reparation offering. To acquire forgiveness for public sin or sins that would affect community. So all these um, sacrifices were revealed to Israelites, the ancient Israelites, God's people of the Old Testament at that time and at the foot of the cross. Right subsequently, right after they have re, uh, God have, uh, has revealed a Decalogue to them. So let's talk about these sacrifices a little bit, shall we? Um, Let's, let's skip all these details. Perhaps that's for, uh, um, for, for people who have, let's say, that, let's say this, for people who have special interest in details, right? And uh, it happened to be that I was one of them. But let's skip those details, right? N not everyone, in everyone likes those details. But there are some lessons that we can find by reading these chapters, Leviticus 1 through 7. First, not all sacrifices brought about forgiveness. Remember, only the sin sacrifice and the, uh, the, uh, the guilt of reparation sacrifice. But all of them brought about atonement. I'll speak about atonement just in a bit. They, they brought about atonement. Atonement or forgiveness were available in relationship with God were available for everybody. For everybody. If, uh, if a legislation stipulates that if, a, if you can, as a worshiper, uh, uh, offer a bull, which is the, the priciest uh, animal, you can do that. Do that. If you cannot do that, you cannot afford that, then offer a sheep or a goat. If you cannot afford that, then offer a bird. If you cannot afford even a bird, then offer a handful of flour. Everyone can get a handful of flour, right? So relationship with God, atonement, forgiveness, must be available for everyone, for everybody, regardless of their financial, regardless of their social status. It must be available for everybody. Some sacrifices were voluntary, Burnt offering, grain offering, well-being offering, voluntary sacrifices. You can offer them whenever you want. They're not mandatory. But 
Um, but sin offering, guilt offering, those were mandatory sacrifices. You must, you must offer that sacrifice if you have committed either public or, or a private sin. Who would control whether you offer that mandatory sacrifice or not? Nobody. Nobody. The, st the legislation does not give any hint of any sort of human control or kind of check whether you offered as an Old Testament worshiper a mandatory sacrifice. It is, the, the legislation assumes that God's people will want to do this. That God's people will want to do this. Regardless of all the messiness and discomfort, but God, it is expected that God's, pe God's people would do this. Amazing, something amazing, at least, um, at least, uh, at least for me. Um, I'm missing that point, but a sacrifice must be slaughtered by the worshiper themselves. It's not the priest, but it's the worshiper that must slaughter the sacrifice. So imagine, imagine yourself in the Old Testament times. You go to your fold, you pick up that lamb like this, innocent, was nowhere around when you committed your sin, and you take that lamb to the sanctuary, and you slaughter that lamb, and priest says, priest takes some of the blood, applies that blood on the altar or in the sanctuary, depending on your social status, and he says, you're forgiven, go home. You are forgiven. And you know that that lamb didn't do anything of your sin, but yet it died instead of you. You are happy, but not fully, right? You're happy that you're forgiven, but you think, how is this possible? Why is this like this? That someone, that someone has to die for my sin. I'll come back to that as well. I have a lot of things that I need to come back to, but uh, bear with me, please. Relationship with God and spiritual growth that were embedded in the sacrifices experience in the Old Testament reminds very much to the relationship between the New Testament believers and Jesus Christ in the New Testament. There are very, very huge similarities in terms of the, the nature of the relationship. It was the same, my brothers and sisters. As I was saying before, uh, uh, modes of communication were different, but the essence of it was the same. Um, we, we should not nurture our relationship with Christ only when we are in some, some, some sort of trouble. But we should nurture that relationship always. Always. Because his love amazes us so much. His personality is something that attracts us. Christ longs to forgive sins of all of those who seek forgiveness, regardless of their financial or social status. He longs. And he knows all our sins. He knows them. They're open. An open book in front of him. And he longs to forgive those. To all of those who seek forgiveness. Christ never forces believers. Never forces people. Never forces anyone. Into a relationship with him. Never. Believers should want to be with Jesus because of their personal and willful decision. They want to 
nurture to develop relationship with him in the same way like in the old testament in the old testament sacrifice sacrificial laws there was nobody to force you to do any of this it is you who want to do that it is you who decides and commit yourself to, to be doing this however re reading through uh, leviticus 1 through 7 um, I leave this for you just for a moment. Um, reading through Leviticus 1 through 7, uh, where these sacrifices were specified, uh, and learning that each of them brings, uh, uh, brings about atonement on the behalf of the worshiper might be confusing. There is no forgiveness, but there is atonement. Just two of them, two of these sacrifices, they bring about forgiveness, but all of them bring atonement. So what is that atonement? What is the mechanism? What kind of a mechanism atonement is? Um, that is not explained in these chapters, but it is explained in Leviticus 17, 1, uh, 11, I'm sorry. Leviticus 17, 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of, of the life that makes atonement. Wow. So this text, of course, is based on a deep symbolism, as the entire sacrificial system in the Old Testament is, but not the one that we cannot understand. It's a very clear one, actually. God explains in this text that blood represents life of a body of the body life life is that um, uh, liquid that dis that distributes oxygen and 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 uh, and the nutrients through uh, 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 within our body and 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 it maintains it preserves life so god as such god has assigned atonement role to it it is not to be eaten in any way. It is not to be carelessly spilled. But it is to be applied on the altar at the sanctuary. And the last line of this verse is a final touch to this mechanism. Atonement is achieved by the way of ransom. Ransom. Blood of or life of the sacrificial animal is spilled and applied to the altar, the animal dies, as we spoke, so that the worshiper does, need, does not need to. The worshiper goes home, atoned for or forgiven, while sacrificial animal dies instead. Sacrifice of Jesus Christ cannot be understood without the Old Testament background. And Jesus himself and the New Testament authors, they understood this. And they are referencing to the Old Testament sacrificial system so frequently, so frequently. Such precision in the regulations related to the, to the sacrifices, I am a little bit behind with this, I'm sorry, but I'll leave, leave it for you. It is there for some time, so. so uh, this such a precision and and uh, and uh, and details were definitely novelty for the Old Testament uh, God's Old Testament people, but the phenomenon of sacrifice was not. They, uh, I'd like to uh, to remind all of us that uh, God God's people did not come to the foot of the Mount Sinai without any knowledge of him. Of course, they knew that he's a deliverer. They just experienced that. But they had the book of Genesis already available to them before they arrived to the Mount Sinai. Um, uh, uh, Moses, as he was shepherding his uh, pastoring, actually, uh, his um, father-in-law's uh, flocks, God inspired him over there in the land of Midian to write down the, con the entire content of the book of Genesis. 
foundation of the entire Bible. So they were able to know this, and um, this is, uh, this is the, the quote that, uh, from Ellen G. White where she says, here, I'm adding the in Midian, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wrote the book of Genesis. Uh, I encourage you to read the entire, the entire uh, quote. It's, it's really a nice one, but I am, um, I'm, I'm just getting the, 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 the most important point so we can, so we can uh, continue. So as Moses and Aaron and the elders taught God's people various points of revelation found in Genesis, and now, having these new revelations, they were able to make perfect connections. Everything made sense. So we can be assured that all the important truths, such as the truth that God is creator, the book of Genesis, God is creator, the fall of Adam and Eve, and, and the consequences of it. Uh, the promise of the Messiah, the history of, of the patriarchs who were preserving this promise of the Messiah and were waiting for the fulfillment of the messianic prophecies. And all the other truths from the book of Genesis, they could have, they knew the, all of this. They had the chance to, to know this. And as the, uh, as the uh, sad account of Genesis 2 and 3, of the fall, and then um, uh, uh, of Adam and Eve in, into sin. And uh, they were still ringing in their ears, and they could hear just a few lines further in Genesis 3. They could hear the following words. Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between you and your and, and woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. This God speaks to, to, uh, to serpent at this point. So um, uh, immediately after the sin appeared, the book of Genesis is introducing the concept of Messiah, the promise of Messiah, the Savior. Uh, that, and it was so related to the sacrifice. Sacrifice was the institution that were to keep, to save these promises about Messiah for the, for the up upcoming generations. These Israelites at the Mount of the at the, foot of the, at, the, at the foot of Mount Sinai, they knew that all their ancestors, they were offering sacrifices. Um, Jacob, Abraham, Noah, all of them have been offering sacrifices. And uh, it is far to assume that also Isaac offered them as well. And eventually they could have learned that God himself had introduced this institution of sacrifice immediately after Adam and Eve have sinned. In uh, um, Messiah, we can say, becomes sacrifice at one point. He was portrayed in the promises, in the prophecies, as a sacrifice, and he became one. Um, there is in uh, Genesis 3.21, we read, The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and, and, and his wife and clothed them. And this is just a couple of verses after the promise of the Messiah. Just a couple of verses. Although text does not specify that the animals were killed to provide these coverings, these skin coverings for Adam and Eve, it is a fair implication and the one that God's people learning these sanctuary laws could construct. Commenting on, on, the, first, uh, on the first sacrifice, Ellen G. White speaks. This is a little bit longer quotation, but I think it's, it's, it's significant. So let's go ahead and read it all. 
The sacrificial offerings were ordained by God to be to men a perpetual reminder and a penitential acknowledgement of his sin and a confession of his faith in the promised Redeemer. They were intended to impress upon the fallen race the solemn truth that it was sin that caused death. To Adam, the offering of the first sacrifice was a most painful ceremony. His hand must be raised to take life which only God could give. It was the first time that he had ever witnessed death. And he knew that he had, that, that had he been obedient to God, there would have been no death of man or beast. As he slew the innocent victim, he trembled at the thought that his sin must shed the blood of the spotless lamb of God. This scene gave him a deeper and more vivid sense of the greatness of his transgression, which, not, which nothing but the death of God's dear son could expiate. And he marveled at the infinite, at the infinite goodness that would give such a ransom to, say, to save the guilty. Though an oblique, through an oblique reference to animal sacrifice, Genesis 3.21 pictures a theological portrait that informed sanctuary laws God's people had just received at the foot of Mount Sinai. They realized that a sacrifice had been providing renewal and assurance of that special union with God in Eden and it also supposed to bring the same provisions now for them. In addition to being the creator, God had become God the savior immediately after sin interrupted the harmony of this planet and the universe itself. It is the sacrifice that facilitated this new salvific role of God. The same God of love reveals himself as he had and, and he has the same goal of caring and saving his people. A very complex, but yet very hopeful and very uh, comforting uh, messages that we can find in the sacrificial system in the Old Testament. And in closing, um, question why sacrifice? can be answered by listing several points derived from the totality of God's revelation that was available to the Old Testament, to the, to the God's people of the Old Testament. Sacrifice because the promise about Messiah had been tightly related to the sacrifice. Messiah will be the ultimate sacrifice. This promise was kept alive through this institution. Because offering a sacrifice was not intended to acquire God's favor on the behalf of the worshiper, but rather to extend it to them. God's favor was already secured because of God's love and care for humanity. But the sacrifice was there to give us the chance to in, enjoy that, to experience that. The process of offering a sacrifice show, show the worshiper that sin is a huge obstacle and must be taken very seriously. What? Sacrifice assured the worshiper that Messiah will become an ultimate sacrifice himself and he will put an end sin. With such importance of the uh, sacrifice, it is not surprising that at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, John the Baptist joyfully exclaimed, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away, who takes away the sins of the world when he saw Jesus coming to him. 
John the Baptist declared, in other words, that Jesus, the Messiah, will live his life patterned by the sacrifice. And finally, he will die as a sacrifice for the fallen and hopeless humanity. All those Old Testament sacrifices were pointing to Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice for humanity, and provided experience of spiritual growth for God's Old Testament people. This is the primary, the primary importance. I hope, it is my hope that after spending some time in uh, uh, reading about and reflecting on the Old Testament sacrifices and their importance for the New Testament realities, we can, with Old Testament worshipers, be reminded of the greatness and depth of Jesus' sacrifice for each one of us personally. I hope that we will look at the Old Testament sac sacrifices with much more appreciation and clarification and clarity. I also wish that this understanding of sacrifices may revive our own dedication and commitment to the Lord. And finally, may we all in that new, renewed, revived relationship with God be empowered to share the gospel, to share the great news about the ultimate sacrifice that was offered for us. Amen.